during the life of the Sega Saturn, it was known for its exclusives and a number of great two-dimensional games. Sega would develop action and RPG titles for it you couldn't play anywhere else, and third parties like Capcom and SNK used it for some pretty compelling ports of their great arcade lineup. Due to the overly complicated nature of the Saturn's internals, however, many multi-platform games ended up suffering on it. Whether it was performance issues, rough-looking textures, or some other technical flaw, an unfortunate number of games failed to live up to the same playability on other platforms. In this episode, I've decided to put together a list of the best multi-platform titles available on the Saturn. All of these looked and played comparably well next to other console versions, despite the Saturn's dubious reputation for butchering games from other hardware. I have purposely left off games the Saturn was well known for, so the two-dimensional stuff from Capcom is not here, nor most of the other popular two-dimensional arcade ports. I consider all of these well worth owning on the Saturn, not only being strong in side-by-side -side comparisons to other versions, but sometimes even besting them. We are going to be moving through these kinda fast, so let's get started. We start with a first-person shooter that was released in August of 1996. Alien Trilogy was a story loosely based on the first three films in that cinematic series. The dreaded xenomorph threat has run wild, and you'll need to use every weapon at your disposal to stop it. This port was handled by Probe Entertainment, and the results are quite nice on the old Saturn. It runs smooth for a game of this type, and the environment is fairly detailed. There is a short draw distance, but the dark areas hides a good majority of it. There are some nasty mesh transparencies in place, but outside of that, this is a damn fine alternative to the PlayStation Edition. There's lots to do here as well. More than 30 levels await exploration, and there are some nasty bosses waiting for you at various points in the story. Lobotomy Software were not the only ones capable of an impressive first-person shooter on Sega's complicated hardware. December of 1996 brought us Andretti Racing by Electronic Arts. This was a combination stock and IndyCar racing game with a ton of tracks, two-player split-screen, and customization options that really change up the gameplay. Lots here to see and do, and the visuals hold up really well. The performance is smooth, and the draw distance is far enough ahead of you to not destroy the illusion of a cohesive environment. Some of the models are a bit ugly, but the gameplay is strong enough to look past it. There's also some nice camera options here that can make a big difference in how it plays. Overall, it's a solid racing experience that has enough bells and whistles to be worth a few hours of your time. It also happens to be nice and cheap on the gray market. You typically don't think of real-time strategy games as a console staple. But in December of 1996, the Saturn got a port of Command & Conquer that was shockingly good. Not only was it easy to play with a controller, but it has some impressive animation and the full motion video looks fairly solid for a game of that generation. This comes with two factions to play as. It gives you 30 missions to play between the two across two vastly different storylines. Of course, the controller isn't quite as smooth as a mouse, but the interface has been tweaked a bit to make things easier to navigate and control. The missions vary in type, but are essentially centered around building a base, creating units and weapons, and then taking out the enemy. This holds up really well on the Saturn, and even when the screen is full of sprites, it stays nice and smooth. There aren't a lot of games like it on the Saturn, and this port shows the genre could be done right with a bit of effort. Unit lost. 
October 1997 brought us one of the Saturn's best-looking 3D fighters, Dead or Alive. This was done by Tecmo's Team Ninja, and was the first in what would become a long-running series of fantastic fighters. It started as an arcade game running on Sega's Model 2, and then was ported home to both the Saturn and PlayStation soon after. The home versions needed to dial back the arcade's 3D backgrounds, but other than that, everything turned out extremely well. The models look great, and the arenas are large and very nicely detailed. At first this comes off as a ripoff of Virtua Fighter, right down to the 3-button layout. But play it once and you'll see there is actually a lot more to it. The gameplay is built on a counter system that allows you to reverse incoming punches and kicks and start combos of your own. Add in the explosive floor and the different techniques for each fighter, and you have a real standout on a machine dominated by traditional two-dimensional fighters. If Sega's fighting game lineup never felt quite right, I definitely recommend this one instead. When Lobotomy Software delivered Power Slade to the Saturn in 1996, it was a huge surprise. A first-person 3D engine where you could run, jump, and even fly across huge environments. That one could easily be on the list itself, but I instead want to talk about their 1997 release of Duke Nukem 3D. They took Power Slave's engine and completely rebuilt Duke Nukem with it. That gives this version a rather unique look and feel that no other version had. Most of you probably know this one really well. It follows the story of a one-man army dealing with an alien invasion. You have a pretty radical arsenal of weaponry, everything from missile launchers to a shrink ray. The Saturn version has a variable but mostly smooth frame rate, and the texture details are really nice. Opinions vary as to the best console version of that time, but no matter which way you slice it, the Saturn did a heck of a job here. In 1996, the Saturn got a port of Gremlin Interactive's Loaded, an overhead running gun that uses pre-rendered sprites against a polygonal playfield. I love this game and its exaggerated lighting effects. The story is out there as well, with six psychopaths blasting their way off a prison planet run by a tyrant hellbent on stopping them. This is hyper-violence at its finest. Blood splatters, dismemberments, and charred remains litter the playfield. This one has a lot going on and the performance does take a hit when the screen is loaded with enemies and effects, but it never ruins the fun. It feels a tad like a more action-focused Diablo, where you care a lot less about the loot and a whole lot more about the body count. You can even bring a friend along for this trip. There was a sequel on the PlayStation that unfortunately never made its way to the Saturn, but this one right here is still an adventure well worth taking. Sega utterly and completely failed its fans when it came to NFL football on the Saturn, but thankfully the Madden series turned out just fine. Whether it was the 1997 or 1998 version, you can't go wrong with either one. This was actually right up the Saturn's alley. The two-dimensional players allowed the Saturn to focus its polygon abilities on the field and stadium, giving us a convincing playground. The gameplay translated really great as well. You have all the plays you need to take your favorite football team all the way to the Super Bowl. I know some of you loathe sports games, but this stuff was a huge part of my time with the Saturn. Just make sure you have plenty of room to save, because these games have massive data files that will soak up the tiny memory of the Saturn in no time. Good pass. 
pass protection is a key to good pass. Remember that game Return Fire? Well, in 1997, Mass Destruction carried that torch and turned out really well on the Saturn. It's an overhead combat game in a similar vein as Electronic Arts Strike series, only this time you have a few different tank classes to choose from. You also have access to missiles, flamethrowers, and mines to lay waste to everything on the screen. There's two dozen missions to complete, and there are even some secrets to discover. Games like this really bank on blowing things up, and it's crazy fun doing it. It doesn't focus much on any strategy, except staying alive and destroying everything in sight. It's a great way to let off some steam, and the Saturn version trumps the PlayStation Edition in nearly every way outside of the transparencies. It's sharper, runs better, and has shorter load times. In April of 1997, Quantum Factory ported MechWarrior 2 31st Century Combat to the Saturn. It's a port of the PC version with a streamlined interface to suit the console crowd. Just about everything here has seen trimming and simplification. The stages, the combat, it really is focused at a more casual market. But the core game of Mech Combat is still good to go and the Saturn does a decent job with it. VDP2 draws the sky and the ground to the horizon, so the playfield looks absolutely huge. The combat is basically you blowing up enemy bases and other mecha. It's nowhere near as good as the Gun Griffin titles, but it is compatible with the mission stick and doesn't play bad once you get the hang of it. In June of 1996, Electronic Arts released The Need for Speed, a racing game featuring exotic cars and seven locations to drive them on. The Saturn version builds on the original 3DO release with more tracks and vastly superior performance. This runs much faster and smoother, with only the PC version besting it. The gameplay has also been touched up a bit to be more forgiving than the original, though it's still a far cry from the arcade racers of the time. You can change the time of day you race in as well. The real bonus here is the two-player mode, which can be really fun with a friend. I prefer this over the PlayStation release and still play it from time to time. If you like this, look up the Japanese version called Nissan Presents Overdriving GTR. As you probably have guessed, the entire lineup of cars are from Nissan, and there are additional changes like gameplay tweaks to match the new car lineup. It's a good one to look out for if you enjoy regional changes. Not long after the US Saturn was released in 1995, Crystal Dynamics gave us Off-World Interceptor Extreme. This was a car combat game where your goal was to survive a run through a war zone, battling obstacles and other vehicles while collecting money you could use to buy upgrades for your ride. This one has roots all the way back to the 3DO original, and while it's far from a great game, there is a certain arcade appeal that can be fun in short bursts. It's frantic, challenging and supports multiplayer. No version of this runs super smooth, but the Saturn edition does about as well as it did on the PlayStation. Again, only the mesh transparencies stand out as any real difference. In July of 1997, Resident Evil, or Biohazard in Japan, finally came home to the Saturn. After loving this one on the PlayStation, I was really looking forward to see how it fared on Sega's platform. And for the most part, it was great. 
Pretty much everything you loved about the original was replicated here, with only the transparencies offering any real downgrade. The textures were different, but I honestly feel some things came off better in this version, particularly the joints on many of the character models. But what really matters is, is that the mood and ambiance carried over, allowing this one to make you feel exactly like you should, being locked in a place like the Spencer Mansion, with lethal experiments running amok. Next Tech did the port job, and they would go on to do Code Veronica for the Sega Dreamcast. Road Rash 32-bit was on everything, and the Saturn was no different. In June of 1996, Electronic Arts unleashed a fantastic port of the 3DO original, complete with its incredible grunge soundtrack. Your goal is to survive races across the California countryside, win money, buy better bikes, and become the ultimate Road Rasher. There's an arcade mode that lets you jump in without all the characters and bike shopping to worry about, if you're not interested in that kind of stuff. No matter which mode you choose, the gameplay here is absolutely timeless and is still one of the best games of its type. The Saturn port takes a hit in the sound effects department and has weaker sky effects, but makes up for it with a smoother frame rate. What matters here is gameplay though, and in that regard, Road Rash is still one of a kind. Another 3DO alumni made its way to the Saturn in June of 1996. Shockwave Assault is a 3D shooter about an alien invasion of Earth. With our military obliterated, the only hope left is a small group of freedom fighters using strategic hit-and-run tactics in a final bid to stop the incursion. The Saturn release here contains most of the content from the 3DO original and its expansion, Operation Jump Gate. At the time, it was something of a rare thing because it allowed you to fly around off the rails and attack where and how you wanted. It runs smoother than the original and is quite comparable to the PlayStation port. Nothing here was spectacular and it could get repetitive the longer you played it, but it could still be fun once in a while. Along with the shooting action, there is a nearly feature-length movie telling the story. It adds an old-school charm that most games don't have today. Defending their refineries, a stray shot could ignite the structures and damage us in the blast. Staying on the 3DO kick, Solar Eclipse was a continuation of the Crystal Dynamics developed Total Eclipse games. The Saturn never saw a port of the latter, but Solar Eclipse here was released in November of 1995. As in Total Eclipse, this was a forward-scrolling shooter where you must navigate alien terrain, survive an onslaught of enemies, and defeat bosses at the end. The formula is nothing special, but it is challenging, and the presentation works well. As was typical of the time, Crystal Dynamics added live-action full-motion video to tell the story, this time using Claudia Christian of Babylon 5 fame. Not outstanding, but still holds its own against the PlayStation version. Shield Energy. Shield energy. Shield energy. In February of 1997, Electronic Arts brought its Strike series into the third dimension with Soviet Strike, an isometric shooter where you must perform various missions in a bid to avoid outright war with Russia. If you were a fan of the Genesis titles, this needs no introduction at all. Get your mission briefing, deploy into the field, and blow stuff up. 
The Saturn release came after the PlayStation and had a number of changes to the difficulty and presentation. There's a new easy mode that mitigates some of the original's harder areas, and there are new graphical and sound touches to what you see and hear on the screen. The erratic frame rate of the PlayStation version moves over here, but it's a little less jarring, and those great lighting effects are still intact. It's short, challenging, and takes some time to learn, but can be an absolute blast once you do. It supports both the mission stick and the 3D control pad, so be sure to try them out to get the most out of the control. This one needs a modern remake ASAP. Situation normal. All filed up. Return to base. In late 1996, Street Racer was released in Japan and PAL regions to glowing reviews. And rightfully so. You will rarely see a third-party title use the Saturn's hardware so perfectly to bring you a stunning visual presentation. Developed by Vivid Image, who also did the Mega Drive version, this uses VDP2 for the ground and sky, while using sprites for the vehicles and polygons for the track details. The combination was potent and allowed it to run at 60 frames per second, a stunning speed for a racing game of that time. As you can probably guess, this was a kart racer where you could use weapons against the other competitors. Tracks are small and the action is intense, and it supported eight freaking player split screen. It was one of those special games that showed the Saturn's hardware working together in harmony, and it was the best version of this game in regards to performance, detail, and special effects. It's a radical departure from the typical arcade racers that appeared on the Saturn, but I really enjoyed this one once I got used to it. Fans of retro games know the Tempest series really well. In late 1996, the Saturn got an update to that game called Tempest 2000. It began life as an Atari Jaguar title before being ported to the other 32-bit machines. It brings along multiple modes of play. Tempest Plus is an update to the original with an improved presentation. It can be played both alone and with a friend. Tempest 2000 mode is a complete overhaul and a brand new experience. Finally, Tempest Duel is a two-player competitive version of the game. At its heart, it's still the same great stuff that it was all those years ago, and the Saturn does a fine job in this port. High-voltage software got the look and feel of this one spot on. It even has that killer soundtrack along for the ride. When it comes to shooters, there's nothing else quite like it. Thunderstrike was a heck of a game on the Sega CD, so when Thunderstrike 2 was released for the Saturn, I knew I had to give it a go. It landed fairly early in the life of the Saturn in late 1995, a 3D shooter that had you blowing up enemies and their bases all across the globe. Developed by Core Design, it uses a map that allows you to go anywhere you want within its play area. It doesn't really rely on any real strategy beyond seek and destroy, so the action is geared more towards arcade fans. But it runs great, and the gameplay is seriously fun. Not even the close draw distance takes anything away from it. Camera angles allow a more simulation style feel, or you can pull it out and play it like a first or third person shooter. Add in mission stick compatibility for the ultimate setup and the best way to play it. Like Command & Conquer, you'd never think 1997's Warcraft 2 would work on a console. 
Yet here it is and more than playable. The Human Alliance is doing battle with the Orcish Horde. Both must collect resources, build armies and bases, and then eradicate their foes. Climax handled the porting duties here, and they did a really nice job. Menus are hidden until you need them, and the streamlined interface is about as controller friendly as you can get. The Sega Mouse isn't supported unfortunately, but it's still quite accessible nonetheless. Visually, it won't knock your socks off, but the campaign is vast with loads of replayability. It contains over 50 missions across the two factions, each with its own story and objectives. It's not the best way to play this game today, but on consoles at the time, you could do a lot worse. Awaiting order. Yes. Yes. Our last game was a huge release in late 1997. Wipeout XL, or Wipeout 2097 as it's known in PAL regions, was a sequel to the original blockbuster Wipeout. When it came to the Saturn, I was expecting an absolutely butchered port that looked and ran like total crap. Turns out Tantalus and Perfect Entertainment did quite the decent job here. Like the original Wipeout port on the Saturn, the textures are a bit rougher and the transparencies take a hit but it still runs fast and the gameplay is still very accessible. That gameplay is based on combat racing, where you can launch missiles, mines, bombs, and other munitions to slow down your competitors. There are also helpful power-ups like shields and an autopilot to get you ahead of the pack. The music selections here differ from the PlayStation original, but it still sounds great. I actually didn't play this one until a while after its release because it never came out in the US. Even if you have to import it, give it a go. The Saturn was not drowning in games like this, and it's still got the chops to be enjoyable all these years later. Autopilot engage. Of course, I couldn't go over every single decent multi-platform title on the Saturn in a single episode. If you like this topic, let me know in the comments and maybe we can do a part 2 in the near future. While not every title here is going to appeal to everyone, I think I got enough variety to at least pique your interest in a few of these as a Saturn owner. While it's natural to gravitate towards the exclusive stuff, multi-platform releases can be a source of surprising quality. Of the games I showed you, the most common downgrade you'd see is the lack of transparencies in 3D games. They were often replaced by ugly mesh blobs that looked just awful on modern technology. This wasn't much of an issue back in the day when we all had CRTs and composite video, but it sticks out today as a glaring flaw you see time and time again. On the positive side, the Saturn also had moments where its hardware provided real advantages. When VDP2 was harnessed properly, games like Mass Destruction and Street Racer showed the hardware could do some impressive things. It wasn't always a case of terrible ports, despite what some people out there would have you think. I'm SigalordX, thank you guys for watching, and I will catch you next time.